Hello. My name is Mark Champkins, and I am an inventor, like Wallace out of Wallace and Gromit, or like James Dyson, or like the creators of the kind of gadgets you get if you just Google the word invention. Gadgets such as the baby grow mop. <laughs> now, I can... I guess this is for combining child care and cleaning, I don't know. Or, hairy tights. Ooh, yeah. I guess that's for avoiding unwanted male attention, who knows. So I'm aware that I'm not busting any kind of stereotypes because I'm a bald, middle-aged, odd-looking man, but when people, I introduce myself to people as an inventor, they usually say one of two things. They'll say either, okay, what have you invented then? Or they'll ask me, they'll, they'll be quite excited and they'll say, I've got an idea for an invention. And you would be surprised the number of people that have an idea for an invention that they're sitting on and they just want to talk to somebody about it. Um, and that's led me to develop my own theory. Now there's a saying that everybody has a book in them. I believe that everybody has an invention in them. I believe that at some point in their lives, everybody will either stumble upon or come up with an idea that will be a great product or invention. And the purpose of my talk today is to encourage you to embrace your inner inventor. I think it would be good for you, I think it would be good for everybody, good for society as a whole, if we invented more. So, why should we invent? Well, the first reason is, there are a lot of stupid ideas out there. There are an awful lot of daft ideas, badly designed products, but I actually think that that should be a source of inspiration, a source of encouragement. In Japan, there's a whole field of product design known as Shindogu. And that takes it to an extreme. So shindogu, shin, the shin part means useless or weird, and the dogu part means tall. So it means useless tall, which is ironic because I quite often get called a useless tall, but <laughs> that's, that's another story entirely. Um, and these are, are the kind of crazy gadgets that I showed before, the kind of mop and like windscreen wipers for your glasses and that kind of thing. But I actually think there's something quite joyful about these things. You know, they're like visual puns. And if ever I come up with, you know, an idea occurs to me that's slightly daft, I think, do it. I would encourage everybody to do it. Why not try? So, so here's some examples of, of my own Shindogus. This is one. Uh, this is my ultimate holiday driver's T-shirt. <laughs> so the idea is when you're on holiday and you might end up with one arm more tanned than the other, so this solves the problem. And I think you'll agree it looks pretty sharp. <laughs> my next invention's uh, these are pre-chewed pencils. <laughs> now, about 10 years ago, I made these for real. And at the time, I was developing products to help kids to concentrate at school. And they were serious products to genuinely help. And at the same time, I thought it would be kind of funny to try and sell brand new pencils, but just chewed up at the end. And so I thought, well, I'll do it. I'll do it just for a joke. So I made these very four pencils. I took a picture of them, and I put them on my shop, on my website. For some, like five pounds for four, I thought, put them on. Of course, nothing happened. And then I, I came in one Tuesday morning, and my phone was going absolutely crazy. And it was people from all over the world wanting to order them. I, I still don't really understand what happened. I guess someone blogged about it, or I don't know. But people wanted to order them. I got a, a call from a Spanish company, and they wanted 5,000. And I, I, for some time, I was like, are you sure? I thought maybe something had been lost in translation. But it, what, they genuinely wanted them. And then I asked, when do you need them? And they said, next week. So I, I, I said, I think maybe, maybe I can do it. Put the phone down and thought, I don't know how I'm going to do this. So I phoned up factories and said, have you got any kind of chomping equipment that you might be able to lend me? No. Um, I bought dentures from eBay because I thought I could take the teeth off and maybe chomp, maybe put them on pliers or something. I even considered those chattering teeth that you can buy. I thought maybe I could, no, right. So I was getting desperate. Friday afternoon, I called up a bunch of my friends and I said, look, could you do me a favor? <laughs> And they came, I didn't tell them what the favor was, so they all turned up, right, and I worked out it would take three hours for us to chew through these pencils, disinfect them, so we sat half an hour in, one of my friends picked up a second pencil and chewed two at the same time. We all looked at each other, we doubled our productivity <laughs> there and then. It was amazing. It was amazing. So, Aside from losing friends and increased dental bills, I would encourage everybody, have a go. You never know what might happen with your idea. And this leads me to my next point. You owe it to your inner child. Pablo Picasso once said, every child is an artist, 
The problem is how they remain an artist when they grow up. And I think that's true of creativity and invention in general. I spend a lot of time in schools and I work with teachers and pupils and what I find is they are endlessly creative. The younger they are, almost the more creative they are. I often start with an exercise, design your classroom of the future. And I get some great responses. This is one of my favorite. It's amazing, right? So they have lava lamp lights, they have chutes for transporting around the school. Every child in this class wanted to introduce monkeys to the, to the classroom. I can't think that that's going to end well, but that's what they wanted. And my favorite part are these chairs. So these chairs, they hover, naturally, and they have uh, fish swimming around them. So you climb into the chairs and you might have a jellyfish kind of pulsing around you. It would be amazing. It would be an amazing product. But what I find is as I meet and work with kids that are slightly older, they seem to lose the value of their creativity. They, they don't value it as much. And often they have a lower sense of their own sort of worth, the value of their ideas. Genuinely true, I worked in the same school with a classroom and they were four years older. And I asked them in that class, tell me about a piece of work that you feel really proud of, the best thing that you've ever done. And I got this response from one pupil. None of my work has particularly shone which is crushing, right? Absolutely crushing. So I think we owe it to ourselves to always maintain that sense of creativity and that childlike quality that, that makes you want to just ask why. And equally, as Steve Jobs once said, to stay foolish. My next point is, I think it scratches an evolutionary itch. I mean, we're here talking about ingenuity and I think we are hardwired to be ingenious. Everybody is hardwired to be ingenious. We're unique in our ability to imagine something. In the animal kingdom, we can imagine something, spin it around in our minds, and translate it into a real product. And I think that's profoundly satisfying. To imagine something and then see it become real is great. And I, I, I find you, you look at things like the Bake Off and the Great Sewing Bee and you know, programs about creation and the number of maker spaces, you can see that it, it's something that naturally people want to do. Um, and I think also, if that thing that you've created is useful, if it has an impact on somebody else's life, and perhaps even an impact on somebody's life beyond the span of your own, how satisfying is that? And there's never really been a better time to pick up new skills and develop skills over, over a lifetime. This is a free CAD software package that you can learn, but from CAD to coding, you can go online, instructional videos, you can pick up these new skills, and it's a profoundly satisfying thing to do. My next point is that it relies upon observation and people watching. Now, who doesn't love a spot of people watching? I find it quite relaxing to kind of put my phone away if I'm in a station or whatever and just watch, just watch people, watch what they're doing. And uh, often I think that's a source of really good ideas because you can start to see where, where people are finding difficulty with products or they're doing something awkwardly. And that's an opportunity to design something better. But it's also an opportunity to notice things, to notice things about the materials used and why things have been chosen, why particular materials have been chosen or the form or function of something. And I think that opens up ideas or possibilities for ideas. So let me give you some examples from my own work where an observation has led directly to, to an invention. I'm always slightly sad when after Christmas, it's January, and you see this kind of thing, a Christmas tree discarded. Now, it's been growing stoically for like 10 years in some spot in the world, and then somebody's chopped it down and you've had it in the living, corner of your living room and it's been slowly dying over a month and then it gets chucked out. And I just think that that's a profoundly sad thing to happen to this poor tree. And I kind of thought about, wouldn't it be great if you could replace it? So you could nurture a tree and plant a tree to re replace the one that you've, you've, uh, you've mercilessly chopped down. And uh, so I invented these, which are bio baubles. And the idea is it's a biodegradable ball with a little sapling in and a plug of earth. And after Christmas, you plant it and it biodegrades and it protects it while it's cold and then it grows through and replaces the tree. And then playing around with that idea took me on to these. And these are birthday cards. And I managed to find somebody who could mix wildflower seeds into the paper. So the little dots that you can kind of just make out are wildflower seeds. So you get a, a card and some flowers. And when you plant them in the earth, you water them and they begin to germinate. And in this case, these are herbs. So these are basil seeds. And so you end up effectively eating your own birthday card, which I think is quite a nice, nice notion. I came across this gramophone, and there was something about it that just stuck in the back of my mind. I think it's the elegance, like the shape of the, the horn. 
is a really efficient way of amplifying up the small sound of a needle on the record. And it's been refined over the years, no electronics, just that shape. And something about that stuck in my mind. I thought, that's useful. And it was some time later that I was playing around with my mobile phone, and I thought, I need a way to amplify this. So I give you the iGrammo, old meets new. And also kind of magical reactions, magical things that do something unexpected. These, this strip is a bimetallic strip. They're used quite a lot in kettles, and they're used in thermostats, and they bend with the application of heat. And there are different temperatures, the metals bend at different temperatures. Um, so you can choose one that's specific to what you need to do. But there was something about this again that I thought, that is kind of cool, and I'd like to make a product about that. So it took me a year or two to kind of think of the perfect application. But in the end, I came up with this, which is a light shade that opens up like a flower with the heat from the light bulb. So you turn the light on, the excess heat from the bulb causes the metal to bend. And then, of course, when you turn the light off, it closes back down again to a bud. So I think quite often with observation, just noticing, just keeping your eyes open can lead to something that later builds an idea, builds a product. My final point, and this sounds a bit grandiose, I'm aware, but this is a TED talk, so I thought I'd go for it. Um, for the good of humanity. Now, what do I mean by this? If you get along to any museum or gallery or exhibition of science or industry or technology, you will probably find one gallery that's laid out on a timeline. And these, I find, are fascinating. They give you certain insights. There's one particular gallery, one of my favorites, it's called The Making of the Modern World. And as you walk through, you walk through, I think it starts around about the Industrial Revolution, you get to 1928, and there's a small box, a tiny little box, and you look into it, and there's a preserved bit of mold. And when you read, it is the actual bit of penicillin that Fleming discovered, the spore that flew in maybe through his window, landed on the, the uh, agar, and led to the discovery of penicillin. And, and uh, I guess the point about it is, before you meet, meet that line, you walk along, people were dying of, of bacterial infections. You get to that point, and this has been invented and refined, and past that, people are living. It's estimated that that penicillin saved about 200 million lives. So the inventive process, that the point of noticing that, and the point of the inventors that stabilized it, enabled, uh, enabled it to be distributed, has profoundly changed the world. So that's the first observation. The second thing that you can see, if you walk along, is you'll see an object here on one line, and then another object here, and then you'll walk a couple of paces forward, and you think, hang on, that looks like that and that crossed together, combined. And then when you start to no look at it, you see that that happens across the gallery. People are combining ideas in new ways to get new inventions. And it's, as Newton said, if I've seen further, it's by standing on the shoulders of giants. And you can see these connections. I think that's very interesting. But more inspiring still is if you follow these connections back, if you follow how they connect, 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 they end up back at a kind of source point. And when you look into it, it's incredible how often those, those starting points have been discovered, stumbled upon by unlikely inventors by people who were in different fields or different industries who stumbled upon an idea and it led to a whole industry. And I find that most inspiring of all. There has never been a better time to be an inventor. It's never been easier to get free software, to learn new things, to get online, to have instructional videos. It's never been easier if you have an idea to get things 3D printed inexpensively. It's never been easier to get started, to get funding for your idea, to test whether it's a really good idea using crowd funders. And if you're really stuck, there are thousands, literally thousands of design graduates pouring out of our colleges who are looking for live projects. It's a really great time to be an inventor. And I urge you, if you have an idea, you don't know where it's going to end up. You don't know who might be able to build on it. I think everybody should embrace their inner inventor. And that's why I think everybody should invent. Thank you very much.